So thank you um, for being here today and witnessing God stretching me today um, because um, God's funny like that. And actually the message he gave me, he gave me about uh, stretching, so it's great. So he's awesome. Because does God ever speak to you about something maybe in your devotions and then he tests you on it in a couple weeks and you're like, oh, wow, that wasn't for somebody else, it was really for me. And so... God's awesome like that. He's just great. So um, we're about halfway. We're a little bit over halfway through the year. I heard somebody already, oh, uh, was it Hallmark, already did like their Christmas in July movies. I missed them. I don't know. When it's hot, I can't think about Christmas. But we're halfway through 2019. Can you believe that? It's just crazy. And um, I don't know. Do I have any extreme goal setters in the room like, you set these, like, huge goals. Some of you, there you go. Some of you guys need to stretch yourself and set bigger goals. There, thank you. All right. So that would be me, and um, I'm a pretty, like, ambitious goal setter. I'm an optimist, so, like, I always think. So today, uh, we were talking with the staff, and I'm like, okay, so I'll speak and um, do offering, and then I, I'm going to teach growth track, too. And, then, and they're like, no, you're not. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can do it. And um, I call that being optimistic. Um, sometimes it's just not wisdom. But <laughs> I am an extreme goal setter. And January started, and I don't know about you. Anybody have, like, all these goals, and you're just really going at them? And um, anybody just really hard on yourself? Oh, see, now, there we go. I tend to maybe be a little hard on myself. Um, so if that's you this morning, I think we're going to relate to each other. And um, so January, we're in a new season as a family. I had a two and a half month old baby and, you know, but I still had all these goals and we have a dream board in our house and we're putting up all these dreams. And that's a couple months ago, it was end of April and um, I'm looking over them and I am just feeling really bad about myself. I'm gonna be really authentic with you today. And um, I really was feeling like a failure. And I thought, man, I'm just not measuring up to a lot of these things. What am I doing wrong? And, you know, I'm beating myself up a little bit, a lot. And um, one of the goals I had set was I was determined that every morning, the very first thing I was going to do in the morning was get up, read my Bible, have my alone time, pray, do my devotions. Now, that sounds good, but I had a two and a half month old, <laughs> right? And I was determined, I was doing really good for a little while, and like I was getting it, and I was like, all right, that's the first thing I'm gonna do because God, I'm giving you my first part of the day, and I was not realizing the season I was in and making all these goals, and I was just really hard on myself. And so that day, I had missed my first appointment with God because the baby had gotten up early and all that, and I'm like, you know, trying to feed him and read, and it, it I'm like, this isn't even effective. What am I doing, you know? And so that evening, I was just down on myself. You ever just got, kind of got down on yourself? And it wasn't something I could sit and talk to somebody about because they didn't get it. And I'm like, God, I'm just sorry. I know I've disappointed you. You're mad at me. What's going on, you know? And um, I was about eight o'clock at night, and I heard God say, hey, come have dinner with me. And I'm like, dinner, God, like me and you have breakfast. I missed our breakfast appointment. You're mad at me now. Surely you don't want to have dinner with me, right? Because God only does the things, the ways we think he's going to do them. And so I'm like, no, God, like me and you, we, we have breakfast. I already missed it. I'll have to wait till tomorrow. Surely uh, you don't want me to have dinner with you. And I just felt God say, no, come have dinner with me. So I'm like, all right. So I get my Bible out. I go sit on our little table. The baby was in bed and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And um, I sit down and I open the Bible and I hear God say, hey, I said have dinner with me. You don't have any food. And I'm like, oh, like I thought like the Bible was our dinner and like I'm being super spiritual to God. And I'm like, God, you're not as spiritual as me, I guess. Like we are, this is the word, the bread, right? He's like, have you eaten today? And I'm like, again, no, I haven't read your Bible. He's like, no, like dude, have you eaten food today? And I sat there, you know, I have to relate to moms for a minute. And I thought, you ever had to think at 8 o'clock at night, did I eat today? And I sat there and thinking, did I eat today? I don't know. Did I? You know, and I'm like, 
okay, so God, you care? You mean, you don't care that I missed my appointment with you this morning, but you care that I didn't eat? And that sounds simple until you're in that moment. And so I walk over to my refrigerator that's not as cool as this one. Mine isn't even magnetic anymore. I just have a problem with that. Can't hang nothing up on it. But anyways, so I walk over to my refrigerator and I open it up. Ooh, this one is much more organized than mine. All right? Mine, you can't hardly tell any. And um, I, get out ta- Ooh, I get out taco leftovers. Anybody love tacos? We have tacos in our house on a regular basis, so I had some leftovers. And that night, I sat down with my Bible and taco leftovers. And um, I'll have to say, God totally changed my life over leftovers, over tacos. Um, And I don't know, anybody here love leftovers? Anybody here like, I won't eat leftovers, it's gross? Hey, no. Um, Anybody feel guilty for throwing your leftovers away so you put them in a container, put them in the refrigerator only to throw them away in a week? You just feel guilty, right? You feel like, how wasteful. Like 80% of the world is starving. I have to put it in the refrigerator. And like, then when it grows mold, you're like, ah, uh, you know, I can't eat it now. I got to throw it away. But it just made you feel better. Okay, see, we're in the same family here. All right, there we go. So as I was um, eating my, ta- I won't throw taco leftovers away, sorry. I will scrape mold off and pretend it wasn't there. But, no, I'm kidding. I don't. Just put extra salsa on it. It's fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. None of y'all are going to come to my house for dinner now, right? All right, so, and this is um, the passage God took me to that night. And I had read it a hundred times, but it just jumped out at me. And it totally changed my perspective in this season of my life. And um, it was in 2 Kings, and I'm not going to read you the whole story. I'm just going to kind of summarize it for you. 2 Kings 4, there's a story of a widowed mother of two. And her husband had been a prophet. And so um, she comes to Elijah, Elisha, and she says, hey, my husband's died. We're in terrible debt. We have nothing. Me and my two sons, what are we going to do? I don't don't know what we're going to do. And so Elisha tells her, hey, what do you have in your house? She's like, like, didn't you just hear me? We have nothing, 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 gonna die, don't have anything, we're out. No husband, nothing, 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 that's it. And he, and she, and he looks, I, mean, I can just see Elisha looking at her like, really nothing? It's like when your kids are like, mom, I can't find the mustard, we have none, and you're like, did you really look in the dirty refrigerator to find it? No, like Elisha knows, and so she says, we have nothing but a little bit of oil, And so Elisha tells her, all right, collect every container, and like I'm picturing like uh, Tupperware, Rubbermaid containers. Does anyone have a million lids and no containers? What happens to them? I don't know. If anyone knows, please let me know, because I have all these lids. They don't go on anything. I don't know where they go. But anyways, um, yes. I know, there has to be a miracle somewhere to find them. So he says, go collect every container you have and just start pouring your oil. And so she starts pouring her oil into all these containers. Every container she pours it in is filled to the brim. She keeps pouring, it keeps being filled, keeps. And then finally, when she runs out of containers, not oil, when she runs out of containers, the oil stops. And this is the scripture that God really messed me up with. And it was 2 Kings 4, 7. So Elisha says to her, okay, now sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what's left over. You and your sons can live on what's left over. And God, lo- God just spoke to me so strong and he said, Kim, right now, You feel like you have nothing to give. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough energy. You don't have enough of anything. But you are gonna live on what's left over. What's left over, those leftovers that you feel like aren't enough, are actually more than enough for you to live on. You and your sons. You see, he didn't just stop at you're gonna live on it, but it's so much left over that your sons can live on it. And I started thinking about this and I thought, 
You know what? What an awkward time in this lady's life for Elisha to walk in. You know, um, it said her husband was a prophet, so he was a man of God, served God, he had died. So she's a widow, her husband just died. Wouldn't it make more sense if Elisha would have just come in and just met her need? and just like prayed for her and just, I mean, things just start appearing, the oil just starts appearing and all this money starts flying and you know, oh thank you. But that's not what God did. In her moment that she felt inadequate, insufficient, not enough, God tells her to pour. He says, pour. And it spoke to me because so many times in what seems to be my moments in life that I don't have enough. I don't, maybe I'm, I'm just, you know, I feel like I'm just barely making it by and I'm just everywhere and there's nothing left and I feel depleted and I feel like that seems to be the moments in my life that God says, okay, now pour. Go find someone, go find something to pour into. And I'm like, but God, I don't have enough. Like, I don't even have enough. And how are you asking me to pour into someone else, to pour into something else? I don't have enough money to pay my bill. How are you asking me to pour and give offering to you? That seems to be the time in life where God tells us to pour is when we feel like we don't have anything to pour. And so because this lady kept pouring and doing what she was commanded to do, her, what was left over, can you imagine how much oil had to be left over for her to live on the rest of her life. She lived on it the rest of her life. One act of obedience can change your whole life. You see, we say, but God, why would you want me to do this silly thing, like collect all these containers and pour oil? Like that's not what I asked for, God. I just need money. I, I just need a way to pay my bills. I, don't, I need to know how to take care of my kids. But one act of what seemed to be silly obedience allowed her to live and prosper the rest of her life, and not just hers, it was a generational blessing to where her sons lived on that the rest of their lives. And what I feel like God is saying is there are some things that God's gonna ask you to do that the overflow from it is not only gonna change your life but your children's lives. And sometimes we're so hesitant because we say, God, that doesn't make sense, not right now. Have you ever told God, um, you know, God, I'm just kind of in a season where I just need to sit. And I am in a season where I just feel dry, so I, God, just need to, um, I'm trying to say it without revealing the words you guys say to me sometimes, but I'm, <laughs> um, I'm in a season where I've just really been used a lot by God. There we go. Um, but I just need to um, absorb now. Like, um, I need a little break in this seat. I need a little break because, see, people did tell me when I had a baby, you need a break. And I like, but I tried to take a break and I felt horrible because God said, Kim, you need to start pouring again. Because when you pour again, the miracle is in the leftovers. The miracle will always be in the leftovers if you start pouring. So a lot of times we tell God, God, I can't pour right now because I have nothing to pour. But could it be you have nothing to pour because you're not pouring? It's not your season. It's what you're doing in your season. And so Sometimes we've told God the season. We've said, God, right now I'm exhausted. I just need to receive from you, God. I am, and I, I mean, I've tried it before. I promise you, you'll never be replenished until you start pouring. You'll never be able to live on little leftovers, what seems to be little, until you start pouring out of overflow. And I think, so that was a remarkable time in my life, and that, that was the main point God gave me is, Kim, the miracle is in the leftovers. Not when you feel, we always talk about, get ready for overflow. Like, we're gonna overflow with joy. We're gonna overflow with finance. We're gonna overflow, overflow, overflow. And there, there is a time for that, but usually, overflow is for others. Leftovers are for us. And, there's power. The miracle, though, is in the leftovers. And even Jesus, Jesus liked leftovers. 
he fed, there was two accounts where he fed multitudes. And um, so my husband is like Jesus in this way. Um, he, my husband never, pastor never likes to run out of anything, anything. So like if we order lunch for the staff and we have five people, we get like five pizzas. Right, because we have to have, we don't ever want to run out. He hates the scarcity mentality. He wants there to be abundance, right? And, um, which is good, but then you try to eat all the pizza, and then there is abundance, and you're like, oh, no. Um, so Jesus was like that. He, he never wanted to run out. He never ran out. And two different accounts, the disciples come to Jesus. They have this big multitude. Disciples come to Jesus, and in one, Philip says, Jesus what are we gonna do? We don't have enough to feed all these people and they're hungry. What are we gonna do? And Jesus takes the little they have. And here's what I like about this. Jesus didn't perform the miracle. He waited on the disciples to come to them with what they had. Jesus knew the people were hungry. You don't think he didn't know? Like if the disciples picked up on it, you know Jesus knew, right? Jesus knew they were hungry, but he didn't do anything about it. He waited for the disciples to bring him something little that they had. So the miracle didn't happen because Jesus knew they were hungry. The miracle happened because they brought Jesus a little bit. They brought him something that they said, all right, Jesus, they're hungry. We don't really have enough to feed them, but here's what we have. We have a little bit, that's it. We just have a little bit. Have you ever felt like you, you go to God and say, God, don't you know my need? You gotta know I'm hungry. You gotta know I have this. I, gotta have, I don't have enough, and you just expect God to do it? He won't do it. He won't do it until you bring him the little that you have. So they bring him the little. The miracle would never have happened. None of those people would have been fed. None of them would have been poured into had not the disciples brought the little bit they had that wasn't enough, that didn't seem like there'd be enough. So the disciples bring them the little bit and say, I don't really even know if this happens, if this can help. But Jesus takes it and he does something. He breaks it. What I've learned about God is... When we bring him a little bit of what we think is a little that's never gonna be enough to meet our need, we don't really know that we're bringing it to him until it hurts us. What does that mean? When you know you're at the place of depletion and you know, God, I need you, but I don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough health. I don't, our relationship is stressed. There's just not enough. I don't even know if it's gonna make it. But when you bring it to Jesus, it hurts. Sometimes there'll be a season in your life when you're doing and you're bringing that little bit to him, like you're mustering every little ounce of faith you have up. You're doing everything and saying, okay, I don't even know if it's gonna be enough, but here, God. And then, when something happens in life and it really hurts, we start to doubt God. We start to say, wait a minute, God. I brought it to you, I brought you this, I brought you this, and now now I'm hurting. Now it seems like things are hurting in my life. If you're in the season where you feel like I've done everything I can, I've brought him everything I can, I've given him everything I can, and you just feel like things are hurting and breaking, Get excited, because the next season is coming. And after he started breaking it, that's when overflow started happening. And they had so much overflow, so much overflow that the disciples collected 12 baskets of leftovers. So again, the miracle, the overflow was to feed others, to pour into others. And then after, as a result of that, they had the leftovers. Is it? A coincidence that they collected 12 baskets and there were 12 of them? Is it a coincidence? Do you think that God understands, hey, if I can just get you to pour, if I can get you to feed somebody else, if I can get you to give of yourself to somebody else, he knows what's waiting. He knows you're gonna collect the leftovers to live on and what's left over will sustain you. And that's what happened in that story. Jesus cares about leftovers. Because they gave, they had leftovers. God's really been dealing with me of just taking my giving to another level this year. And um, 
It's funny, because sometimes we like to believe God for everything else, and when it comes to money, we like to tithe, we give offering, but you know, if we're believing him maybe to be debt free or to pay things off, we forget like we're involved in that, you know? And so God started speaking to me and said, okay, Kim, what areas are you lacking in? And I think everybody can get it. Maybe there's an area in your life you know you're lacking in. Check your giving in that area. So you may be saying, man, I really feel a lack in my health right now. I am struggling in my health. I'm just really struggling. What part of your health are you giving back to God? You know, I have to say, there's a gentleman here, and, and I watch you, pastor and I watch you every Sunday, and you bless us so much. You're in a, he's in a wheelchair, and he pulls up here, and we watch him roll to his car, get out of his car, pick his wheelchair up, load it in his car, and drive off every week. And I look at him and I think you inspire me because there's some people that have two legs to walk and they take it for granted when they come in here. There's sometimes we take it for granted that we can raise our hands. We take it for granted that we can speak and praise God, that we take that for granted. So if you're struggling in that area, what are you giving? Is your body a temple? Are you giving it all to God? If you're struggling in your finances, wherever you're lacking, that's where you should be pouring. If your finances are lacking, you should be pouring. If your marriage is lacking, you should be pouring. You should be pouring into your spouse, not complaining about them. You should be pouring. So look at the lack. So what we like to do is if we're lacking in an area, we just push that area to the side and go to another area that we're strong in. Now, God says, I don't want you to lack in any area. So wherever you're lacking, start pouring. Start pouring. And finally, I'm um, coming to a close. The, the last place in the word of God that God just took me to that dealt with leftovers, uh, the story of Gideon. Gideon was an Israelite, so he was one of God's chosen people. And in Judges 6, the enemy had come in and totally destroyed the Israelites' land. They left the Israelites with no food, they took all their livestock, they destroyed their crops, they just totally stole everything to the point that the Israelites were reduced to starvation. They had nothing. And finally, the Israelites cry out to God because they had turned their back on God. And Gideon, he was a son of Joash, and he was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. So Gideon, he's like hiding the little bit he has, like they have a little bit of grain left, so he's down hiding it from the enemy, and he's, you know, he's down there. And in this, in this space of trying to hide his little bit, he has his little bit, and he's trying to keep it from the enemy. You ever feel like you're doing that? Like, I got my little bit of peace, so I gotta hide it from the enemy. I can't let him have it. I got my little bit of healing. I may not have it all, but I got my little bit of joy, so I'm just gonna you know, hide it. I don't want the enemy to steal this too. And that's what he was doing. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. In verse 13, Gideon says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to our enemy? Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe, and I'm the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. So the enemy had taken everything from God's people. Gideon is hiding. He's holding on to this little bit that he has. And in that moment where Gideon felt his weakest, he is hiding out. In that moment, God speaks to him and calls him a mighty hero. Is that crazy? That in the weakest time, when he felt, and he kept telling God, God, what, I, me? I'm the weakest. I, I'm nobody in my family. I'm the least among all. Why are you even talking to me, and yet you're calling me a hero? In my weakest moment, you're calling me a hero? And so God tells Gideon, go, you're gonna save your people. Do you ever feel like God 
just gives you this impossible task and he's like, this is what you're gonna do. And you're like, huh? Come again? Like, do you know who you're talking to? Not me, I'm down here hiding. Like, pick somebody else out there that's strong and mighty. Like, you're calling me. I'm gonna save my family. I'm gonna lead. I'm the only one saved in my family and you want me to lead them? God, me, I'm gonna do this? I'm gonna set my family free? I'm the weakest. I, who, me? And God says, yeah, you're the mighty hero. You're gonna do it. So Gideon does what a lot of us do. He's like, all right, God's told me I can do it. I don't really believe I can, but here we go. I'm gonna get some help. So Gideon rallies some troops. He, he must be pretty influential because he got 32,000 men together. Isn't that funny? Sometimes we think we're like this, but you had to have some influence to get 32,000 people rallied up against the enemy. So sometimes who you think you are it's totally different than who you really are. Because God said, no, you're a mighty hero because God knew who he really was. So he gets 32,000 people together and I can imagine he's like, all right, now we're good. I got 32,000. Maybe they can kill the enemy. Maybe I won't, but they will. We're good. And God comes to him and he says, uh-uh. Nope, nope, nope. Judges 7-2, he said, God says to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight your enemy, the Israelites will boast to me that they save themselves by their own strength. Sometimes I feel like God's trying to say, if I let you get that raise and make six figures, you're going to think your blessing and your abundance came from your own strength. But if you will just trust me and give me what you have. See, it doesn't make sense that God would say, hey, I know you don't have enough money to pay your light bill, but give the $100 you have in your bank account. We're like, but God, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. What if I just go back to school and I get a better job, God? And he says, no, no, no. You're trying to do it in your own strength. And I'm telling you, if you'll just trust me and do what I say, you're gonna defeat the enemy of lack. Cause that's what Gideon was facing. His whole, his whole country, his, all of his people were facing lack. And he thought, I'll just hide wheat. That was his plan to save all these. He's gonna hide wheat. That was his little plan. And God says, no, 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 I have a bigger plan. He rallies his team and God says, no. If 32,000 people defeat the enemy, you're gonna think you did it in your own strength. So God says, nope, I need less. So he puts them through a test and he says, all right. They get dwindled down to 10,000. So Gideon goes back to God and says, all right, see, I sent 22,000 home. I mean, that's more than... D double, that's more than half, like, that has to be good, right, God? And he's bargaining with God, like we do a lot. But God, I did this. You told me to give 100, but I needed to keep at least $50 in the bank. So I gave 50, God. Isn't that good enough, right, God, right, God? God says, nope, too many. He's like, oh my gosh, I went from 32,000, now I'm at 10,000. And he puts him through another test. And God leaves him with 300 men. 300, less than 10%, actually 1% of what he started with. And now he says, and this is the verse that I feel God's really wanting to speak to some of you that feel like you don't have enough to do what God's told you to do. Judges 7:7. 7, 7. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory with what's left over. God wants you to know this morning that what you feel is tiny. 300 men didn't seem like a lot, especially when he started with 32,000. He probably really thought, felt strong, like he could have victory with 32,000. But God said, no, I want to take you down to a little. Because with this little, I will give you victory with what's left over. And some of you feel this morning like the enemy has just come and torn your family apart, your peace apart. Maybe your, your mind is tormented. Maybe your kids, whatever you're facing. You know what your battle is. You know where the enemy has tried to come in. And some of you are hiding, trying to hold. Some of your marriages, you know, are holding on by a little string. And you're just trying to hold on as tight as you can. And God says, I just want you to know if you'll do it my way. I'm gonna give you victory with what's little and left over. Can you stand with me? Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you, God. God, we thank you. I just wanna pray with a few people, and you know if it's you, you know 
if you've just been struggling and maybe, maybe you've been struggling and saying, all right, God, I really, I really want to, I want a miracle from you, but I'd rather you just do it for me. God says, I don't work that way. You gotta bring me the little that you have. You gotta bring me the little that you have and let me break it. That way it can overflow. Some of you need to start pouring again. You feel empty, not because you're empty, but because you're not pouring out. You need to figure out that area you're lacking in and that lack is directly related to how much you're pouring. Some of you, used to be so involved in ministry and working in God's house and serving his kingdom. And you've said, hey, this is a season I just need to receive. That's never in the Bible. It's never in the Bible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not in the Bible because everywhere I see in the Bible, Jesus says, go. Jesus says, give. Jesus says, do. Jesus says, reach out. I'm glad Jesus didn't take a break on me. I'm glad he didn't say, sorry, Kim, this isn't my season. I'm a little tired. I kind of went to the cross and all that already. I'm going to take a break now. Some of you, I hear your heart and you share with me your hurt and I get it, I get it. I've been hurt too. I'm telling you, anytime you wanna work with people, you're gonna have hurt. But this lady in the story with Elisha, this widow, don't you think she was hurting? Her husband died. She was left to raise two sons by herself. You know what we would tell her in the church? Hey honey, just take a break for a minute. Sit here and let us just pray with you. But you know what God said? Hey get some stuff together and start pouring. Go to work, go collect some vessels, go find some empty people that need my presence. Go find some hurting people and pour my love. And when, I, when you're pouring your love and my love, you're gonna receive everything you're pouring and you're gonna live on what's left over. And I just feel the heart of God saying, hey, some of you are, are paralyzed in this place because you're afraid to start pouring again because you don't think you have enough. But God wants you to know your miracle will be in your leftovers after you start pouring again. Some of that's going to hit your finances. You feel like you're just totally in debt and you can't get out of it and you haven't been giving you because you say, I don't even have enough for myself. That's what the disciples said. They said, Jesus, we don't even have enough bread to feed ourselves, but here, and then he broke it and there was overflow. God wants things to be overflow in your life. And then some of you feel like right now, the enemy has just totally destroyed so many things in your life. You don't feel like you're sufficient. You don't feel like you have enough to fight with. And God says, hey, I'm gonna let a miracle happen right now. I'm gonna give you victory in that area you've been feeling defeat. I'm gonna give you victory with little lead that you have left over.